Okay, well, everybody is here for office hours today, and we are talking about um, IEP meeting essentials today. So um, we'll dive right into our agenda and get started. Um, let's see. So um, our first slide here is for meeting our team. So I am Ashley Satry. I am one of the educational specialists on the Aussie monitoring team, and I am one of the new members of the team. So I joined about nine months ago. This is my first office hours, so I'm super excited and also a little nervous, um, but I'm ho so happy that you're all here with us. Um, and before I joined the DOE, I was a teacher here in Maine and in Virginia for about 14 years. Um, and I'm not sure who of our team is here. I see you, Julie. So I'll I am, and there. I think Col I think Colette just hopped back on too. Okay. I think. Hi, I'm Colette Sullivan. Sorry, I'm having a. I live in Portland, so I don't know why I have such issues with my internet. But I am the federal programs coordinator. I am really happy to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. I have been with the department. Um five and a half, I think, almost six years. And before that, I was a special ed teacher for 30 years. Okay, and then we have Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. Um, I have been with the DOE for about, I'm in my seventh year now. I'm the admin support for the monitoring team. And prior to that, I was admin support at a K-5 to elementary school for 16 years. Awesome. And Carly is unavailable right now, and Jennifer will be popping on later, but they're also part of our um, supervision, monitoring, and support team. So um, our agenda, we just started with quick introductions, um, and then we're going to talk about some IEP meeting essentials. And when I was developing this office hours, because I'm new to the monitoring team, I was thinking about what I would have liked to know um, about IEP meetings as a brand new teacher and what I um, now know and would have loved to know then. So that's kind of how I developed this. A lot of this might seem um, repetitive to you guys or you might already know this information, um, but we get a lot of feedback from new teachers saying that there's not a lot of training out there for IEP meetings in general. Um, and I remember that very well, sitting in my first IEP meeting and just flying by the seat of my pants. So I was thinking of this as kind of a first um, introduction for those teachers to have some idea of what they're getting into. Um, and we'll talk about the IDEA and user requirements for the IEP decision-making process, the required participants, um, the major IEP responsibilities, and some timeline stuff. And again, we'll just kind of go over the very basics, we could dive into all of this stuff and do in a lot of our other trainings. So I've linked a ton of resources um, and stuff to go into more depth. Um, so at the end, there will be time for some questions and there'll be time for more resources. Um, but if you wanna be thinking about that as we go through the training, I would love to take feedback at the end for what else you guys think might be helpful for those kind of first timers, first year teachers. Um, so just something to think about as we go through our slides. So um, we are going to dive right into the IEP decision-making process. And um, just a note about the chat box. I can sort of see the chat box. Um, I can't see a lot of the video, but please feel free to drop any questions in chat. I've got a couple of check-ins. Um, and also we can um, check in at the end. And But feel free, if you're brave enough to come off mute, I'd be happy to try to answer questions too. Um, there's, it's not a huge group, so um, that shouldn't derail our timeline. Um, okay, so let's see. So if you've been to any of our other trainings, we like to start with what is the purpose of an IEP. Um, the, the IDEA says that the purpose of an IEP is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them free and appropriate public education that emphasizes special education and related services designed to meet their unique needs and prepare them for further education, employment, independent living, and very importantly, to promote movement back to general education. And I love this as I was digging into Muser, this description of what the IEP meeting is. Often we think about the annual meeting and the goals and all that stuff. 
but I love thinking about the IEP meeting as being a vehicle between parents and school personnel that enables them as equal participants to make joint decisions. And that would be regarding um, the child's needs and appropriate goals, the extent to which the child will be involved in the general ed curriculum and participate in the regular ed environment, so that LRE, and then the services needed to support that involvement and, and achieve accreed, agreed upon goals. Even as I was practicing, I messed those two words up. So, um, so yeah, I just love that um, image of kind of the IEP meeting as that vehicle for communication instead of the nuts and bolts that we all know as the, te as the case managers and stuff. Um, but I like thinking about it as a communication vehicle. Um, some important points to remember about that, of course, that the parents are considered equal partners with school personnel in making these decisions. And the IEP team should consider and must consider the parents' concerns and any information that they provide. Now, the kind of flip side to that being that the IEP team should work towards consensus and agreement with the parent but that the SAU has the ultimate responsibility to ensure that a child is appropriately evaluated, that the IEP provides FAPE, provides FAPE, and that the placement is in the least restrictive environment. So um, meaning that the SAU has that ultimate responsibility. If the team cannot come to a consensus, they're the ones that would make that decision. And so that led me to, I'm a big what if person and my team will tell you that I'll ask, what if this, what if that questions all day long. So that led me to this next slide of what if the parents and the IEP team disagree on those decisions during the IEP meeting. And so if the team cannot reach consensus, the SAU must provide the parents with prior written notice of the school's proposals or refusals or both, because there could be some of both, regarding their child's education program, and then the parents would have the right to seek resolution of any disagreements through those due process hearings or state complaint investigation. Um, so that looks like this. Um, one thing as a new special educator that I would have loved to dig into was the is the effective dispute resolution page. We have an awesome team um, in the department and some of those dispute resolution options would be a facilitated IEP. There's a mediation option. There's a state complaint investigation option and due process hearing. And all of those go into a lot further detail. If you go to that link, um, we won't get into any of that process, but just um, knowing that that would be those next steps if there was not consensus for an IEP team decision. Um, and so just to recap those decision-making processes through the IEP, the IEP meeting serves as the communication vehicle for parents and SAUs to make decisions. Um, parents are equal partners. The SAU has the ultimate responsibility for fate and dispute resolution options are available in, case, in the case of a, of a disagreement. So there's a little recap on IEP decision-making process. Um, and then we're going to jump into the required participants for the IEP meeting. So there are, uh, I believe it's eight required participants for IEP meetings. Um, and number one being the parents. Um, then there's also no less than one regular education teacher. And this should include career, technical, and adult ed teachers when that's appropriate. Um, no less than one special ed teacher. Um, there should be a representative from the SAU that has the following. They should be qualified to provide or supervise special education instruction. They should be knowledgeable in gen ed curriculum, and they should be knowledgeable about the availability of resources and have written authorization to obligate funds for the SAU. Um, so those are participants one through four. And then we've got participants uh, number five. So we've got at the discretion of the parents or the SAU, any others who might have knowledge or special expertise regard regarding the child, including the related service providers. So this is your OT, your PT, your VCBA, um, or any other person that has that expertise of the student. Um, and there should be an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. 
And that can be somebody who is otherwise a member of the team. So not to include the parents, but that can be anybody else on that previous slide. Um, so it could be the SAU director, um, you know, somebody who is knowledgeable to interpret the instructional implications of the evals. Uh, it could be your psych, it could be um, just somebody who's knowledgeable in that. And then um, whenever applicable, the child. And for a child who's a state ward or state agency client, the child's caseworker representing the youth serving agency. So those are the required participants per MUSER. And this brought me to my question of what if? Um, what if an IEP team member can't attend the meeting? So this falls under two categories. There is the attendance not necessary category or there's the excusal. And down at the bottom under the forms, I linked where you can get both of these excusals. Um, but for attendance not necessary, this is when a member of the team is not required to attend the meeting and the parent and the SAU have agreed in writing that they're not required because their area is not going to be discussed or modified. So this would be in the case of a, I don't know if you're adding an OT service and you it doesn't affect maybe the PT or the SLP, you can have them not attend with that being in writing. Um, because their area is not going to be discussed. So the form that you need for that is under that link. Um, and then the other reason that somebody wouldn't be, a, be attending would be an excusal. And this is a member of the team that can be excused um, if their area is being discussed, as long as the parent in writing and the SAU consent to that excusal. So that's another one of the forms. Um, that team member must submit in writing um, their input prior to the IEP meeting. And then the SAU must make sure that the child's IEP team is informed of any changes. So everybody on the team just needs to be made aware even if they're not at the meeting. So that's under excusal. And again, you can find those forms on the IEP forms page that I linked. Um, so another what if question, we've been talking about this a lot on our team. Um, what if the student is of transition age? Um, if the student is of transition age, they must be invited to the meeting. And that goes into detail in the procedural manual on page 38. Um, and then another caveat to that is that if any agency is likely to be responsible for paying for any transition services, they must be invited by the SAU and the SAU must request consent from the parent before inviting. So that goes into detail on page 41. Um, if you're in the audit review process, you've probably heard us talking about that. Um, and so just document in the written notice if you can't get that consent um, to invite them. But if the SAU knows that they're going to be possibly responsible for paying, they must invite the outside agency. So that would be like both rehab. Um, and then another what if question, what if the parent can't come to the IEP meeting? Um, this is something I'm sure we've all come across. Um, a meeting can be held without a parent in attendance if the SAU is unable to convince them that they should attend. Um, but the SAU must be keeping a record of its attempts to arrange a mutually agreed upon time and place. Um, there are some uh, thoughts out there about how many times you should reach out, how you should reach out. I just wanted to put it exactly what Muser said. Um, there's no number attached to these things, but making that good faith effort that you've tried to communicate with the parent, um, including detailed records of the phone calls made um, or attempted results of those phone calls. I know some of the IEP um, services have a call log right in them. You can keep your own call log. I like to do both. I know a Dory has a call log in it. Um, copies of any correspondence sent to the parent and any responses received should be kept. And then this was an interesting one. I wasn't aware that this was in user, but detailed records of visits made to the parent's home or place of employment and results of those visits. So um, that may be a conversation with your SAU about what that looks like. 
Um, but I thought it was interesting when I when I saw that in music because I have done that as a teacher myself. Um, and then I've had instances where I didn't feel comfortable doing that. So I just say, um, make sure you're just recording any attempts or any reasons why you might not do that. Um, just to make sure that you're covered if the parent does not come to the IEP meeting. Um, that was a lot of information about the required participants. Um, any questions right off the bat right now? Um, I don't see any in chat. Look. Um, looks like at CDS, we were told by Roberto we can't hold initial referral meeting and eligibility meetings without the parent. If they are no show, we can't hold the meeting. Um, so that is a good question for Colette, who hopefully is with us here. Sorry, my I'm having a hard time. Um, can, oh, Karen, you know what? Let me get some clarification around CDS, okay? Because there has been some, I just wanna make sure that I'm uh, reporting accurately on information that has anything to do with CDS? Good question, Karen, thank you. That's a good question. Thanks, Colette. Um, all right, so Colette will look into that and um, we will move on to the next section. Um, all right, so the major IEP team responsibilities. So there are five major IEP team responsibilities according to Muser. So we've got number one, determining eligibility. So that's the eligibility that we all know and love, that first uh, referral and eligibility to special education. So reviewing as part of the initial or the reevaluation, that tri triennial meeting, any existing evaluation data, including evaluations and information provided by the parent, classroom-based assessments and observations, and teacher service provider observations to determine if or what additional data are needed to determine whether a child is a child with a disability. And that is a whole um, rabbit hole of information, that whole eligibility piece. Um, and so I put a link to, I think it's Jennifer, it does a wonderful office hours on that. So the link is right there or um, training on that. Um, but that is one of the major purposes of the IEP team. Um, and then we have number two, the second major um, responsibility of the IET, IEP team is determining present levels. When I was creating this slide, all I wanted to do was just put data, data, data all over this slide, because this is where you need your data collection to determine those present levels. I um, kind of went down a rabbit hole myself through all of our resources to determine what might be the best thing to put here. Um, but we had an office, our archives with a ton of data collection modules. Um, and there was also a really good teacher input form for the IEP meeting to get that data from the gen ed teachers um, and service providers. Um, it's a sample, but it has a great um, format that you could follow if you wanted to develop something. I know a lot of schools have their own formats that they like to use. Um, I know my teachers in my buildings would see me coming about a week to two weeks before my meetings and run because I would hunt them down for their um, input for present levels and where they were, where my students were um, performing. So just determining present levels of performance for educational needs in all affected academic and non-academic areas. So that's the second major responsibility of the team. Um, Number three, determining modifications and or accommodations. So this is for students who do receive services, what modifications and accommodations they might need to be successful. But there was also uh, in Muser um, say a point saying that this is determining any necessary modifications and adaptations in the regular ed programming if the existing data is insufficient to identify the child as eligible for services. So I linked our MTSS website because it has an awesome wealth of information, but this is just um, kind of a reminder that if you determine that a student isn't eligible for services, the student obviously was referred for some reason and something is, they're not making adequate progress in some way. So what is going to be done if the student doesn't receive services? 
to make sure that they are going to start making some progress. So um, number three being those modifications and, adapt and accommodations. And this one's all of our favorites. So developing an IEP, that's what we're all here for. So this is developing that IEP um, and or revising the IEP for any student with a disability. And in general, Weezer says that when developing each child's IEP, the team must consider the following, and that's the strengths of the child, the concerns of the parent for enhancing the education of their child, the results of the initial evaluations or most recent evaluations, and the academic, developmental, and functional needs of the child. Um, so that is, oh, this is a cool resource I was, I pulled up uh, thanks to Carly. Um, when I was running my IEP meetings, I lived and died by my checklist to make sure that everything was being covered at the same during the meeting. Um, this is an example of the link. It's really small for you guys to see, um, but the link goes right to it on the website. So you can see this example of a meeting checklist and it has some really great ideas. This one is broken into before the meeting, during the meeting, and after the meeting. Um, and you can adapt it how you would want to. Um, but I just can't stress the importance enough, especially for new teachers, of a checklist to keep things moving. You've got a lot to cover in an IEP meeting um, and also make sure that each area is covered and addressed. Um, and then the final major responsibility of the IEP team being the annual review. So reviewing at least annually the IEP to determine whether the goals are being achieved. Um, and I underlined and linked the case for Andrew F because also revising the IEP as appropriate to address any lack of progress toward annual goals in general education. Um, because while you definitely want to have your annual review and review it at least annually, if when you're doing your data collection and your um, Analyzing your data, you find that your student is not making progress. You're going to want to have a, you're going to want to revise the IEP. You're not going to want to go through an entire IEP year with no progress without changing anything. So um, that's where that revision comes in. And um, that brings us to amendments. So um, I, <laughs> it's funny, I remember when I learned this as a teacher that you did not have to have an IEP meeting bringing the whole team together to make an amendment uh, if you need to just adjust a goal or change something like that. Um, but there are some things you do have to do if you wanna do an amendment without having a full IEP meeting. Um, so in making changes to the child's IEP after the annual IEP meeting for the school year, the parent and the SAU may agree to, con to convene an IEP meeting to make the changes um, and they may develop a may agree not, I'm sorry, got myself confused there, uh, may agree not to convene the IEP meeting and will instead develop a written document to just amend or modify the current IEP. But the SAU must provide prior written notice to the parent. The SAU must inform the IEP team of any changes that are made. And the SAU must provide the, provide the parent with a revised copy of the IEP with the amendments. Um, so those are your amendments. <laughs> Um, a little recap of those major IEP team responsibilities. They are to determine eligibility, determine present levels of performance, determine modifications and or accommodations, develop the IEP, and complete an annual review of the IEP. All right, and then timelines. I'm just going to check the chat box. It looks like Carly's been answering the questions um, as they pop up, which I so greatly appreciate, Carly. Um, it looks like you gotten them all. Awesome. Thank you guys. Okay. Um, so timelines. Okay. For an initial IEP, um, each SAU must implement the IEP as soon as possible following the IEP meeting, but no later than 30 days after the IEP team's initial identification of the child as a child with a disability. So for that initial IEP, it has to be developed and implemented within 30 days of identification. Oh, that did not copyright. Oh, yes, it did. There we go. Sorry, I'm going to click all the way through this because 
I copied this from another slide and I wasn't aware it had this lovely animation. All right, so for your annual reviews, you have your annual meeting date and within 364 days, you have to have your next annual review date. So that is if you have your annual meeting on January 6th, 2022, you would have to hold your next annual on January 5th, 2023. So there's your first 364 day timeline. Now, the parents have, we've got three days or so to get the written notice in their hands. And then they have the seven days to consider the IEP. They can waive their right to that seven day, which would start the IEP timeline sooner. Um, but that roughly is 10 days between the seven days and the three days, which would have your IEP meeting beginning or IEP duration beginning on 1-16-22, which would mean that that IEP would last for 364 days to January 15th, 2023. So there's your timeline for your annual, which I know you guys probably all know that, um, but it's, I feel like this would be a great resource for a new teacher to have printed out on their wall to kind of understand that and see where those came from. I remember hearing the 10 days and not ever understanding what that 10 days was from um, and that being the duration of time to get the written notice out and the seven days um, before the IEP meeting started or IEP started. So um, this is linked in the, in the um, PDF and I think it's a great resource to maybe like print out and stick up on your wall. Um, and then, okay, to recap the important point, um, initial IEPs must be developed and implemented within 30 days of eligibility determination. The IEP can't be written for more than 30, 364 days and the annual meeting dates can't be longer than 364 days. Um, and then this one, I had no idea about to be totally honest, um, until I started this job. And so I'm sure many of mine relate but a full copy of the IEP must be sent home to the parent within 21 days. So that's straight from user. There's your screenshot for that there. Um, and there is a spot on the IEP that says the date that it was sent home and it's not automatically pre-filled. So you might wanna check yours out and just make sure that that gets filled in for the date that it's sent home to the parents because we'll be looking for that compliance wise to make sure it's within 21 days. All right, any questions about those timelines? Oops. There are a couple in the chat box, Ashley. All right. Um, I think Carly answered one already, but there's one about written notice being sent within three days. Um, and that's really only initial, well, it's really to get that seven day notice. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, all right, and then holding the meeting doesn't seem to give the special ed teacher time to get the IEP to the parent before the IEP begins. Judith, do you mind explaining that a little bit more? A few days before the IEP ends. Oh, I get that. That, And that's where the two different timelines come in too, Judith. If you, um, if you, can you go back a slide, yep. Ashley? Sorry. No. So the, the duration of the IEP is a separate 364 day timeline than the meeting timeline. So if you're starting the IEP 10 days out or whatever, however many days out, then you have to have your meeting before the last meeting, not before. I think um, there is some confusion because when this kind of presentation comes out, it makes the special ed teachers believe that they can start that meeting three days before the IEP ends and then still have that 21 days even though the IEP starts the day after the last day of the last IEP. Does that make sense? And so we're having that struggle in our district, trying to teach our special education teachers. They need to have that meeting 
far enough in advance so that the IEP starts and everybody has it the day that it begins or should begin. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's it's a struggle here. This is a confusing timeline thing. Jennifer, I see you're nodding along there. So do you, <laughs> I'm gonna let tag you in. Yeah, that that is an issue. And that can you go back one more slide, Ashley? The one with the yeah, see at the bottom there, there's two different two different 364 day timelines. So I do like think this IEP what... is good until the 15th, but the next meeting has to happen on the 5th. This kind of clicked into me just as I was putting this this together that there are those two different timelines. Yeah. Because, and that was, so maybe we can think of a way to show that differently or like separate that out in our IEP training, just something to think about for our Yeah, our it's, it's a hard thing. And, um, and some people, like in this situation, would put the duration as 116, 22 to 1, 5, 23, but it can go that full 364 days to give you that buffer that you're talking about, Judith. Right. And and that, you know, 21 day time period where the IEP is sitting expired and um and people are asking for it, it it's really hard. And so I come from New Hampshire, New Hampshire, I would be the one to schedule all the meetings and I would schedule those meetings three to four weeks before the IEP ends. Still yeah, getting that's definitely the way to go. notice. But I just feel like this is very confusing to our people in our district because they're thinking, well, I'm going to start the IEP on 116, but I don't have to get it to the parents until 130 or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, 22. Yeah. That is good feedback. And thank you for that. Cause we, I myself have struggled to understand this timeline. So um, that's good for us to think about as a team for a way we could maybe present that differently, at least in our trainings. Thank you so um, much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So we'll go, let's see. Um, okay. So that leads us to our resources. Um, and so the procedural manual is an excellent resource. It has, it goes into depth for all of these things. It tells you about forms and how to fill them out. Um, it's a great resource and this, these links will all be live and I'm sure you all know where to find them, but um, the link to Muser, which is definitely a more difficult read as I learn it myself and read through it. Um, it's quite um, a dense read, we'll say, but there's the link to it and the language from this training. This is my very favorite resource. Um, as soon as I learned about this, I just tell everybody I know about it. So hopefully you've all seen it, but this is what we call our quick reference document. And it's not so much related to this training, um, at, but it's more um, for those, when you're thinking about your new teachers and um, starting out, this has all of the things we look for for compliance during our reviews. Um, and it breaks it down by section of the IEP, why we're looking at it. So the Muser citation and where that comes from. And then it tells the criteria that we're looking for. And it's, we call it a quick reference document. And I think it's like 16 or 17 pages, um, which is a lot. So it's a little overwhelming to look at at first. Um, but I just try to tell people to give it some time, sit with it as you're writing your IEPs. And it really starts to make sense. And when it clicks in, and when it clicked in for me, I will say, it just really made so much more sense to me and um, is a really, a really valuable resource as a writer and reviewer of IEPs. Um, and here are some of our resource links with QR codes for our professional development calendar, um, links to our recordings and PowerPoints, um, some other special ed resources, some law and regulations, and some forms and reporting. So I linked some of those in the training itself, but this is all of them. Um, here's our professional development calendar. Uh, the light blue links that are already here have the recordings available. And if they're not linked yet, they're not available yet, but they will be. Um, and 
Then these are the registration links for our upcoming trainings. We're almost done somehow. We're already almost to the end of our year of professional development. So we've only got a couple left. Um, and we have already had the um, discipline and manifestation determination one, which is linked to the website. Um, special ed law for gen ed teachers is an awesome resource for gen ed teachers. Um, it will be linked. And coming up, we have, we're very excited, Some most of us are very excited um, about our consultation and related service goals. Um, so that is, uh, is it next week or the week after? It's coming right up. Um, but we think share those with your service providers because um, we'd love to have them there. And here is our professional learning feedback and contact hour form for this training. Um, this is office hours, uh, IEP meeting essentials. Um, you can fill that out or grab the QR code. And before I go too much further, um, I was wondering if anybody, and you can email me too or uh, whatever if you don't feel like adding it, but if there's anything on this topic that you think might have been beneficial to have added in here, I'd love to hear it because um, we'll do this again next year for our professional development. Um, and I just would love to get our new teachers as ready as possible. So if there's anything that we didn't discuss, um, I'm happy for any feedback you might have. And you can Ash also put it in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Ashley, this is Colette. I'm still struggling with my internet. So um, could you give the little spiel about us um, reviewing? Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, let me get to our, I think the next one has our email addresses. There it is. Um, so something we're offering for our as our team is if you are writing an IEP, if you're considering any of this stuff, um, and you have some I, some questions or thoughts about whether it might be compliant or what we're looking for, we're happy to give feedback through email um, in a hypothetical situation. So don't give us any identifying information and don't put it in an IEP. But if you had a question about is a goal compliant? Is it is the data point strong enough? Um, is the alignment good? You're we're happy to take that in an email format um, and give you feedback. So we try to turn it around and get feedback and re uh, response back to you in like 24 to 48 hours, depending on the time of the year. Right now, it might be a little closer to that 48 hours because we're slammed with travel. Um, but yeah, just keep these email addresses. And if you have questions, we're happy to um, answer them or try to answer them or direct you in the way um, to the answer. So um, that is the spiel for that. This is our email uh, information and I'm gonna stop screen sharing, um, but um, we have a little bit of extra time. So if anybody had any other questions or thoughts, we're happy to hear. No? All right. Well, I thank you guys so much for coming. Um, like I said, this is my first office hours, so I appreciate you guys so much for um, being easy on me and <laughs> um, allowing me to stumble over my words a little bit. Uh, the next one, I'll just be a pro. So <laughs> thank you all for coming.